In this video, I'm going to discuss how to visualize and describe data. The example that we're going to use throughout this video is going to be the 2001 CDC College Health Survey. This is a survey that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention used to do among a random sample of college students all throughout the United States. I believe you can still obtain the actual data from the CDC. The data that we're going to work with specifically in this video is the 2001 BMI data. And you can see here I have just the raw data for 20 randomly selected subjects in the data file. So you can see that in this column I have 20 subjects n equals 20 and here are their body mass index scores. Remember that the body mass index is a indication of weight status, either underweight, normal weight, overweight, or obese. Typically somebody with a BMI between around 18.5 and 25 would have a normal weight status. Below 18 would be underweight, 25 to 30 would be overweight, and then 30 to 35 would be obese. So you can see, for example, subject number one is a normal weight status, but subject number three is obese. And if we go down, we can see subject number 16 is overweight, subject 17, 18, and 19, as well as 20 are in that normal weight range according to the BMI. Many times we want to get a picture of what the data looks like. So to do that, we can create a number of charts and figures to display the data. One type of data that we could uh, use in terms of a display is a frequency distribution. So for example, here I've made this one in SPSS, but we could make it by hand. So what we want to do in creating a frequency distribution table, or sometimes called the frequency distribution, is take each score in our data file and make a column of how frequently that score occurs. So for example, in that raw data that I'd previously shown, the score of 18 occurs once. The score of 20 occurs five times. The score of 22 occurs four times, and the score of 23 occurs three times. What we're trying to display in a frequency distribution is how frequently each score occurs. Notice here we don't display any scores that are not in the data file. So normally to create a frequency distribution, of course, we'd have a title. We would have each score in our raw data, and we would place the frequency at which, at which each score occurs in this column labeled frequency. Notice the total number of scores is 20. Another way we could display it is by creating some type of chart. One common chart that we could use is a bar chart. This bar chart shows the same exact information that the frequency distribution table does. But what we've done here is we've created bars that represent the frequency at which each score occurred. So again, along this side, the y-axis, sometimes called the ordinate, we can see the frequency at which each score occurs. So we would want to label this in terms of our range of scores. On the abscissa, or the x-axis here, we would put down each of the scores in our data file. And so here we would make the bar represent the frequency at which that score occurred. So in the current data file, 18 occurred one time, the score of 20 occurred five times, the score of 22 occurred four times, the score of 23 occurred three times, so on and so forth. 
One of the interesting things we're able to look at in this bar chart is the way that the scores are distributed. And what we can see here, there are more low scores or sco scores on the low end of the distribution of scores than there are scores on the high end. But one of the difficulties with this is if we have a lot of data here, a large range of data, it'll be difficult for us to get a picture of how the scores are distributed. If we want to know the shape of the distribution and how the distribution um, is skewed or not skewed, we can create what's called a histogram. The HAL text gives us a number of pieces of advice for creating a histogram. In general, what we do with a histogram is we want to see the shape of the distribution because we're very interested in the shape of the distribution or how the scores are distributed in that particular data set. This is very important for us to understand. Now there are uh, measures that we're going to look at in a moment that will allow us to get a picture of what the data are looking at. But right now we want to look at the shape of the distribution just by looking at a chart. Again, this chart is called a histogram. And a histogram is where we're going to have the frequency of all of the scores on this axis, the y-axis, or sometimes called the ordinate. And then we're going to create bins, bins, not bars, along the x-axis, or what's called the abscissa. There's a way that we can make these bins, and we need to be kind of thoughtful about it. There's no um, exact way to make them, but there are some rules of thumb. What we want to do when we make a bin is we want to kind of have the bins or the intervals for these bins equal to the square root of the sample size. So if n equaled, let's say, 9, we might have 3 bins. So these are not called bars, these are called bins. And what we would do is take a score maybe that is one unit below and one unit above each score. And then we would place any score that is in that interval in that bin. So for example, in that um, bin that would represent 17 to 18, there's one score, and that would be the score of 18. And then if we had a bin from, let's say, 18 to 21, we can see that there are five scores that would go in that particular bin. And then the next bin, that would represent a, a three-unit distribution or three-unit interval, all of the scores would go in there, so on and so forth. Notice the difference between a histogram and a bar chart is the bins touch one another and in a bar chart they do not touch one another. Also notice that we have an empty bin here because there are no scores at all in our data set that are between 29 and 31. So this would be empty. Now, the interesting thing about the histogram is it allows us to look at two things that are very important. One, it allows us to look at the shape of the distribution. And to do that, we might put a line over the tops of all the bins. And I'll try to write a, a line there for you right now. So we might put a line that goes over the tops of the bins. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. But you can see that I put one here for you. And you can see the hump is kind of on this low end of the distribution here. This hump is kind of on the low end of the distribution. In a moment I'm going to show you how to describe a distribution. The second thing we can look at is the fact there are some outlying scores. Now they're not too far away, 32.5 and 35, from the main group of scores, but they are a little bit outliers here, meaning they're farther out. And we'll talk about outliers in a moment as well. So let's talk about describing distributions. The first distribution I want to show you is a normal distribution. In a normal distribution, 
it'll look like a bell-shaped curve. Where half the scores are above the mean and half the scores are below the mean. So half of the scores in the set of scores would be below the mean and half the scores would be above the mean. So this is what we would call a normal distribution. It looks like a bell or takes on what we call a bell-shaped curve. Now unfortunately, most scores in public health do not take on a bell-shaped curve. In some cases you might run into a positive distribution. A positive distribution is where there are more scores on the low end of the distribution than there are on the high end of the distribution. An example of this might be if we had a survey question where we asked people, how many times have you exercised in the last seven days? Most people haven't exercised a whole lot in the last seven days, and maybe some more would have exercised one, and then maybe two, and then there are going to be fewer and fewer people that are going to have exercised um, six days or very few that exercised seven days. So this would be an example of a positively skewed distribution. In a positively skewed distribution, there are more scores on the low end of the distribution than there are on the high end of the distribution. The hump will be on the left side. Now another distribution that we might encounter is a distribution where the scores are negatively skewed. So a negatively skewed distribution would look like this. So let me draw this negative distribution here, or what we call a negatively skewed distribution. So this is where there are more scores on the high end of the distribution than there are on the low end of the distribution. So the hump is on the right hand side and tails off on the left hand side. So an example of data that might be negatively skewed might be something like uh, the number of times people um, ate fast food. There are going to be few people that are haven't ate fast food in the last month, but maybe a lot of people that have done it quite a bit. So in a negatively skewed distribution, most of the scores are on the high end of the distribution. Now we also might run into a situation where we have data that does not take on a positively skewed or negatively skewed distribution, but might be what we call bimodal. So we might actually have a data set that looks like this, where there are two humps. Two humps would be a bimodal distribution, where maybe the scores go up, and then they go down, and then they go up, and then they go down. Usually this is the case when you have data that has been taken from a random sample. You might also have the case where you have data that is multimodal. So it might look like this. And there are numerous modes where we might have scores that look like this. and there are numerous modes. And we'll talk about modes when we talk about descriptive statistics in a moment. So we can see we could have normally distributed data, positively skewed data, and negatively skewed data. We could also have data that is um, not normally distributed. Now why is this important to be able to describe the distributions? Well, there are many statistics that we are going to use that assume that our data is somewhat normally distributed. Now it's not that important that our data is perfectly normally distributed, where half the scores are above the mean and half the scores are below the mean, but it assumes that the data is somewhat normally distributed. If our data has a lot of skew to it, then we will not be able to compute parametric statistics. In general, if the mean, 
of your data is greater than the median, then you're going to have positively skewed data. If your sample mean, or X bar, is less than your median, then your data is negatively skewed. So you can tell something about the distribution of scores if you know the mean and the median. Again, if the mean is greater than the median, then your data is positively skewed. If your mean is less than the median, then your data is negatively skewed. We won't go over how to calculate a value for skewness, but in general, if that value is greater than one, either negative one or positive one, then there is a large amount of skewness. If that value is around 0.5, either positive or negative, then there's not a whole heck of a lot uh, of skewness. And again, very rarely in real public health data do you ever see data that's perfectly normally distributed. So in this video we've talked about um, frequency distributions, we've talked about bar charts, histograms. The importance of histograms are that we're able to see the shape of the distribution, whether or not it's positively skewed, negatively skewed, or it's normally distributed. We've also talked about um, how we can determine the type of skewness by looking at the mean and the median, and we've talked about how to interpret the values of the skew. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you come by during office hours.